under the Controlled Substances Act and Corollary State Law, the growth, trafficking, sale, possession, or consumption of psychedelics may be a felony punishable by imprisonment, fines, forfeiture of property, or some combination thereof. Psychedelic X is for general information only. Information provided on the show does not constitute legal advice, nor does your listening to the show create an attorney-client relationship with the host. And your wall yeah. said, white people go to church and talk to God, we go into our ceremony and hear God. God speaks to us. And so that is our communion. And that is why we should always remember that visionary religion is not merely seeking free exercise, but also the most important form of free speech, which is to let the deity, the divine speak to us and through us. And that we can hear the voice of divine as it comes through our brothers and sisters. This is, in fact, scriptural, the Holy Ghost, right? What happened at the Pentecost? Well, they didn't feel normal in the first place. A wind blew into the place and flames appeared above their heads. And they spoke in a profusion of tongues and all understood each other. Sounds a little psychedelic. Oh, yeah. A- yeah. Absolutely. So, the the, and the this is Bible's the littered with that. The Buddhists call that, you know, because like I said, you know, I did the Tibetan Buddhist thing for quite a few years, still study it. And they call that the Sambhogakaya, which is the pure pleasure body and pure pleasure being the way of experiencing wisdom experientially. So, you know, you have, it's like we should make these correspondences for people to understand in what way it is our practice is religious. But there's something very significant about visionary practice, which is, and I brought this up with a dear friend of mine who's an iOS Garo for many years before I even really knew anything about it. And he, you know, I said to me, egalitarian, um, uh, an egalitarian core to religion is essential, is essential as also a non-conscription provision, you know, conscientious objectorship, you know, it should build in those two things into any religion. It, you know, I don't kill people in wars. Um, and oh, what was my other one, Gary? What was the first? Um, I, I'm not really sure. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. At any rate, um, principles that you have the the principles that you have got to build into your religion. The other one was going to be egalitarianism, right? And and he said nobody in the ayahuasca community is going to go for that because everybody wants to be um, a leader. And you know what? I have not found that to be the case. I have now worked with a bunch of people, and I tell people you need to be the leader because otherwise this thing will fall apart. So you should start it out with yourselves as a leader and. Don't make a big board. Make a small board. You guys are going to stick with the trip. You're going to stick with the trip. You know, later on, but but you should always implement it from a totally egalitarian perspective. Why? Because none of you is a priest, and we don't need priests. That's the big advantage of visionary religion, yeah. is that the sacrament that is not a placebo does not require a magical act of a priest in order to initiate the act of communion, which is the consumption of the divine, which is why we needed priests or believed we needed priests, because to have magic, we need to have someone who would go up on the mountain and touch the fire. You don't need that. Yeah. We the, the act of transubstantiation bring, is not needed. It is not needed. We, we have the spirit made flesh. We can consume it we will receive the act of communion and the Pentecost, you know, the initiation into the Holy Spirit. So, and this is why I, I think that, you know, you ask yourself, you know, why would the DEA never be able to regulate religion? Well, they didn't send anyone to divinity school and they don't recruit there, you know? And you really need to think um, when you're going to represent people who are seeking to get the full value of their First Amendment free exercise and free expression, you have to really think about it. And I'll tell you what, 
whoever Smith's lawyers were, they didn't make the argument to the Supreme Court that Quanta Parker said that you hear from God when you eat peyote. Yeah. And I know that because the entire Smith case, Scalia's sneaky opinion is based on devaluing the prior precedents in by saying that they involved free expression. Yeah, and that was entitled to a higher level of protection. And it's actually that bogus distinction that allowed him to distinguish the Shermer and uh, versus Werner case and the other important um, precedents that RFRA, that RIFRA basically put back in place. And that was the distinction he made. So that's why I say everyone should remember, everyone should think it's not just free exercise, but why do we have free exercise so we can get free speech from the deity, from the divine, from the source of wisdom within us, if you want to be completely non-theistic about it. Yeah, or 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 I I kind of describe it this way that it's it's the notion that you actually do have fundamental First Amendment right to the freedom of your thoughts. You you are not required to have the government intrude on your your very thoughts. Absolutely, and you know that absolutely falls within you know, your thoughts and what is going on in your head should easily fall within the most unquestioned level of First Amendment protection, which is that it causes no harm to anyone, you know? And the idea that a, that a, that a thought that arose during a psychedelic session is more dangerous to society than one that arises through a pornography session is sort of ridiculous, you know? Yeah, but, agreed. You know, but... But the DEA would contend to that. Yeah, well, of course they would. They're wrong, but they would. They were forced to, you know, by a nasty questioner like me. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and it cuts against the whole notion of the right to explore or experience revelatory moments. Um, remembering that even the most prototypical of the Judeo-Christian faiths arose from some sort of an entheogenic basis. And, you know, you, you read some of the prophets' experiences, and my God, they sound like trip journals. And, of course, they would. These are people who were living in a substantially greater agricultural world that didn't have these notions of prohibition. All of these plants and other uh, psychoactive substances were free, available, known, and utilized widespread. Well, not only that, but we're talking not having any kind of clear division between mind and body for the indigenous person. It, if you are going to keep going, you know, the Taramara Indians, do they eat peyote for health reasons, for reasons of stamina, uh, who knows? But they accomplished tremendous feats of stamina while chewing the occasional button and, you know, running 100 miles barefoot across the scrubland. Yeah. Heck, you know, why? Well, you know, among other things, they can actually run deer down. <gasps> That's pretty awesome. That's something that I don't think they could do without some peyote. Oh, that's uh, just agreed. And, and there are tons of examples of native cultures that specifically use psychedelics for hunting. For hunting. Yeah. Ibogaine. Yeah. You can, Ibogaine, you sit, you can sit still, apparently the right dose. They can sit still for a day, you know, eventually, you know, that deer is like right there, you know, really easy yeah. to shoot. By the way, with the sacred era. Anecdotally, I, I don't know if you caught this, but um, late last year, Beckley published a, a very brief study that suggested that low doses, microdoses of LSD, were a better painkiller than traditional narcotics. I could I could believe that. You know, so I was a yeah, I was a I started taking LSD when I was twelve. And, um, and so we were, I, you know, I weighed about hundred pounds, 110 pounds and 
we were taking 300 microgram doses of window pane and orange sunshine. But, um, you know, so we could really feel that energy. <laughs> it was like, but I, it was, it was like, it was part of a lifestyle. So, you know, eventually you start trying things like a tiny little bit. And so I've tried microdosing. I taught, I tried, um, small doses every four hours and the sense of basically increasing the energy throughput of the organism, as I would say now, that's just what it felt like. And uh, yeah, like in no way was I demented or disoriented, you know, um, my LSD experiences caused me to have rational thoughts like Charles, you're going to fail physics. I know, <laughs> I know, I just haven't, you know, and it's like, you can still get a C. And if you do, you will graduate. I know, I know, I know. You must get an A on your class project. That's the way to do it. Right, right. I'll build a smoke ring blowing machine. Yes, that'll work. <laughs> and it did. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you, in my book, I've got a, a small chapter at the beginning listing the professed accomplishments of some very accomplished people while under the influence of a variety of psychedelics. Indeed, the double helix of DNA is reputed to have been discovered as the result of an LSD trip. So, yeah, absolutely. It can do wondrous things for you. Uh, I, I never, I've never heard that one. That's, uh, that's fascinating. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, Dr. Kapoor often tells this story, and it's in his book, The Brotherhood um, of the River, or The Fellowship of the River. Uh, he talks about, you know, he's, a, he's an MD. He's a, got his degree from... Uh, you know, San Diego State, um, but he's also a fully fledged uh, ayahuasca shaman. And he talks about looking at a woman and seeing a DNA transcription error in her genetics. Like her personal genetics? In the genetics? nature of a small, it, it was, he said it was, a, it was like a black snake that was moving through the helix uh, of her DNA. And it was a while before he realized A, that it was DNA, B, that it was like a transcription error. Huh. And um, it's, you know, that and he, as as an ayahuasca, he he describes visions of things like being in a, a physician's office with advanced instruments of a sort that, you know, we don't have, you know. And so the way these the way what these medicines do is to, you know, like it's, I, I tell people and I say, you know, if you don't like iteration, you are in the wrong reality. You know, we get everything through iteration. You know, I say something to you, you say something back. The next thing is a further iteration of that. So we call it a productive conversation, you know. And I think that psychedelics help us to see that iterative activity. And when we see it, one, one effect is ethical. One effect is you it's like that fear of karma thing, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't have so much like this, you know, mm, karmic bookkeeping feeling. There's just this sense of, I can't cheat this reality. You know, I can feel my feedback relationship with it. Uh, and so you begin to realize that the next iteration of that person coming at you is, to some dependent on the last iteration you gave them. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, it's uh, like we're, we are, we're, it's going to keep incrementing. <laughs> Our reality is going to keep developing. It doesn't go backwards. And I think that psychedelics helps us to see, I don't know, it's just the way I interpret it. Psychedelics helps us to see that process. And then we realize, you know, I actually do have an important hand in this. My, my will is actually at the center of it. And that can come in terrifying experiences where, you know, uh, and, and, and also in very fulfilling ones. And, you know, then sometimes in experiences that are simply clear. Yeah. Well, it's, you just get a much broader aperture of consciousness that you're able to hold on to at a single moment. You know, humans are really garbage at holding thoughts. So these 
substances, I think, oh. actually help you to hold and, and broaden that hold. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think that's I, I think that is is a lot of it is that. And, and one of the reasons that I think that you would find, you know, people like coders microdosing is it, it's like you can hold that that mandala that you're working on. You can hold it clearly in mind. I mean, you know, as a lawyer, you've done trials, right? You yeah. know, you've done plenty of trials. You know, it's like the trial becomes you give over your consciousness to all of the subjects that are necessary to do this trial, everything else goes out the window, you know, and then you do that trial and then you get your mind back, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's, and, it's a and, version and so, of Zen mastery. It's, it's, you know, like the, 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 the Zen archer, you are the arrow. If you're not, you're not doing it. And for us, you know, for people like us who've been trial attorneys, I mean, for me, I find that, that's the activity in life that is most fully engaged me, like, you know, Arthur Ashe playing tennis. You know, everybody has their own practice, you know. And what I see developing among the people who are my clients um, is a really beautiful, sensitive spirit. And like I said, egalitarian, they don't need to be priests. They know that the healing is coming from each individual. As Scott has said to me many, many times, I just consider it as just to put the words in his mouth, I consider it my job to stay out of the way of the person's experience of the divine. You know, I'm a facilitator, you know, help them to get comfortable with receiving the wisdom from within themselves. When yeah. you do that, then you have, I think we are, you know, people talk about evolution and, you know, the, the way human physical evolution has basically come to an end because we don't need to specialize in any way. We decided not to have moles noses so that we could smell things really good. We decided not to have, you know, really long teeth so we could tear things apart, you know, or claws to dig with. We decided that we would have hands that could pick up any tool from a paintbrush to scissors to a computer mouse. And now we evolve through selection of tools and media. And people have built whole tribes around what kind of tools. You have these fetishistic weapons tribe that has so much influence in our country. Um, and these people's minds are built around tools for killing. And that just happened to them, unfortunately, due to Hollywood programming. <laughs> And um, so they become fascinated with it and the drumbeat of, of negative fear propaganda ever since 9-11 that's been bleeding out through Fox News and the other media entities. So we're making our choices for how to evolve humanity based on the tools we use. And what I see is that my clients, your clients, are putting are using the tools and trying to share with other human beings the tools for that will heal them individually and focus them on like you know iterating our planet into a new iteration in which life is good and safe secure wholesome as many species as possible clean air clean water happy moms happy dads happy children now that's my vision and what I'm working for and why I, uh, why, you know, this is the only thing I do work on is, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be able to give my, uh, all my attention to this. And uh, it's the most satisfying period of a of legal career of well over 30 years um, because I have absolutely, it's like, and, and you know, I, I'm suing the government, I'm suing all these government agencies, believing they are as polite as high. Yeah, well, they have, you know, they have no reason not to be. That, you know, they have no reason not to be because their guys did wrong. My guys are literally on the side of the angels. And when the law is on your side, you know, it's not necessarily pedal to the metal, but we're going to get there. And that's that. That's that. That's that. And if, you know, and if you have to take the long way around, if you have to go through the night, if you have to go up to the Supreme Court, that's fine. You know, like I say, if you want to do law, you could also maybe want to do whiskey because it takes about, you know, five, six years to get a result. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Have a question about psychedelics and the law? You're welcome to submit them.
Please send your questions to admin at psychedelicalux.com. Submission of questions is not an assurance that they will be used on the show. Also, please be aware that neither the submission of a question nor a response creates an attorney-client privilege between you and the show's host, nor does an answer constitute legal advice. Information provided is for general purposes only. If you need legal counsel, you should hire competent counsel in your community.